Well, thank you so much for your warm welcome this morning. I know I'm a complete stranger to pretty much all of you, so um, thank you for welcoming me in, in love with, with loving Christ. So today I'm going to talk about pro-life conversations, and let's open in prayer as we look at God's Word very briefly, and then we'll go through two very tricky topics about euthanasia and about abortion. So um, let's prepare our minds before the Lord. Father, we thank you and praise you for what a great God you are, that you've given us your word, you've given us the truth, and we know through your Holy Spirit just what to do in response through these uh, very tricky issues. And I pray through, as we look into what's happening in our society today, that we'd be responsive, both in our spirits, but also with our bodies, Lord, that we'd be out there active, participating in your work, where you lead us to go, where you want us to go and speak and share and talk about things and encourage people that are facing some very vulnerable and tricky situations, both at the end of life, Lord, also at the very beginning when mothers are challenged to think about what they're going to do with a child that they're not prepared for. Pray, Lord, that we would be prepared to have a, a reason for the answer for the hope that we have in the context of all these issues. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So 1 Timothy 2, we see uh, this passage that I'm sure you're all quite aware of. Paul, um, Timothy Paul writes to Timothy and says, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And then he goes on and says, for there's one God, one mediator between God and men, Jesus himself. So we, as we see, we talk about political situations, we see that in a free democracy... We not only have a responsibility to pray for our authorities, we also have a responsibility to vote in a way that will see authority is exercised righteously, as we see in Proverbs 14.34, that you know, righteous people is blessed. When, when righteousness abounds in a society, we're blessed. Or when sin abounds, it's a curse to its people. So we have a responsibility. As we see an election coming up in March next year, I think it's important for us as Christians to think about these issues, how we're going to vote, but also how we're going to participate in it sharing the righteousness of Christ's commands to us. What is the good that he's praying to us? We're not imposing upon all of society everything that a Christian is commanded to do, but we do want to proclaim that which is good, that they would follow those things too for the good of them and their families, um, for the betterment of their society. And of course, there's some very basic things that the, God's word tells us is non-negotiables. Taking of human life, of innocent human life, is absolutely um, wrong according to God and of course in our society because it's based on Christian values we uphold these as well whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed that's how serious God treats murder um, he says it's that serious he says in Exodus 20 you shall not murder and he says the Lord brings death and makes alive he is the one that holds the keys of life and he's the one that holds the keys to, to death in Hades and he's the one that is the only one that's authorized in his righteous perfect judgment determine how long your life should be. But if we as humans take life, innocent human life, that doesn't deserve death, particularly the unborn and those at the end of their life, and intervene and, and basically shorten someone's life because we think we know better than God, we're taking the place of God. And it's obviously uh, murder is the sixth commandment and we're breaking that. Whoever causes one of these little ones, this is talking about you know, small children who believe in me, to stumble, it's better that they be drowned in the depths of the sea. So when we sin against or cause a little one to sin, that awful judgment will come to us in the end of all time in, when we face the great white throne judgment. There's an attitude we have in our society today that I think is very prevalent. It says, that when suffering comes to me, I will just curse God or blame God for all that suffering and I'll just give up. And, and, and that's prevalent both in the abortion issue and in the euthanasia issue. Because when suffering comes to a person that says, well, this child is someone that I don't really want. It's going to be inconvenience to me. And also, I'm told by my society and my employer that it will be better for me if I just give up and just end the life of this child. And the same sense is there in, at the end of life. When somebody is facing pain and suffering, and as awful as it feels to them, and I understand that pain because I've been through cancer as well a couple of times. So I know how it feels to be close to, to considering you might, your life might be ending soon. And there's some people that just want to cut short all of that pain, cut short all of that suffering, and compel all of society to say, I want the ability to be able to kill myself whenever and however I want. I want to be able to take a poison, and I want to compel the doctor legally to, to give it to me. 
And that's basically, that's the, that's the attitude, to curse God and die, and or you will die for my comfort. But, of course, the Bible says something completely different. God's word said, Christ says to us, take up your cross and follow me. That, that the purpose of life is actually to bear one another's burdens together as a community, as to, in the love of Christ and in the, in the enablement of the Holy Spirit. Take up your cross means to follow Christ's example of not doing his will, but doing what the Father's will said for him to do. So not what I want, personally, in a selfish sense. It's to to the, for the benefit of others. So at the end of life, an older person or somebody who's suffering with a crippling disease, they could have years and months left to spend time with their family to encourage them, to love them, to be there for them. Because when you... I don't know if you've ever experienced suicide in, in seeing somebody close to you commit suicide. What is the pain that that person feels? It's that, that person has abandoned me. When the family has suddenly, that person has just basically cut short and just abandoned everything. Um, so that, that's, the, that's the kind of battle we're in right now. There was a terrible bill that was passed last year about euthanasia, and I'll just go through some points about what's so bad about it. A patient can self-administer the poison without any supervision. In Victoria, there's only the ability to do euthanasia, which is a doctor gives it to you. In WA, it's the first state in Australia where it's authorised that the doctor can give it to you, or the pharmacist administers it to you. You can take it home and store it wherever you like. You don't have to secure it. And you could be taken at any time with it without supervision. That's how the law has been written. So that obviously, it's a bunch of different problems about how could you be coerced? Is anybody supervised at the correct taking of the medication? All sorts of things can flow for that. Doctors are compelled to falsify the death certificate, which, of course, changes the way we think about death and insurance and everything that's, and, and history and the history of your family. Medical staff who conscientiously object will be forced to provide information on how to access the scheme. So for you as a Christian, if you're in the medical field, you'll be forced to provide information. You won't be forced to participate, but society has now said it's a good thing to encourage people to suicide. And you as a Christian, if you're in the medical field, you'll be compelled to hand over a pamphlet. Um, that's just the way it goes. Unlike Victoria, where they can consciously object and say, I don't want to provide any information at all. And fourth and fifth point is that there's no requirement to store the lethal substance securely, and doctors not prohibited from steering the patient towards suicide. They can actually suggest it as a viable path that at the end of their life when they're suffering and their things are going wrong. And even when other palliative care options are available, even when, um, and they can legally raise the possibility, but they can't supposedly influence the patient. And the, the line that there is is just, I don't know how uh, legally you can determine that. So there's six reasons I want to give you why euthanasia is a terrible idea. First of all, it's part of a general move ever since the 60s and 70s, of course, the sexual revolution, detaching all of our wholeness as a human in, in terms of what we are is detached from the morality of what being a person is. So the sexual revolution, we had the same kind of thing. You, know, you can do whatever you want with the body. It doesn't matter the consequences to your physical body. Just do whatever you want. And you can, you know, you can, you can deal with the consequences yourself. And the same thing has happened with euthanasia and abortion. So, for example, with, with uh, uh, abortion, we start with there that you're a human being, but we as a society will determine when you become a person, legally speaking. Ethically, when we can decide you have rights. So it's not entering the human race that determines whether or not you have rights. It's when we as a society decide we're going to declare you're a person now. So that's why in law, an unborn child is pretty much has almost zero protections, and the law can say these are the small restrictions that need to be there to somehow um, uh, delay the choice of a woman. And, and supposedly that's a good balance. So that's, that's what we're going... And same with euthanasia. We've, we've changed the, the, the conversation about you always have great human worth to now, if you have the right faculties, if, you, if your intellectual capacity is good, if your physical capacity is good, then you should feel like you still have some years left. But if you're, suddenly you're bedridden and you've got this terrible suffering in bed, we should give this option of poison. So that's the problem we have. We detach humanity and personhood and that's, the, that's the, the great schism in our society. So when you go into university, you realise and you talk to those people, those intellectuals, this is what they've done. 
They've detached who you are as a person. So God says you're a whole person, not only what you are physically, but what you are morally speaking. Sorry, I just probably just blank the slide there. What did I do? Oh, there you go. Go back. Okay. So second point is it ejects holistic help. And I just want to explain to you what euthanasia and assisted suicide actually is. So euthanasia is when it's induced by the doctor, and it's also called physician-assisted suicide. Secondly, there's another path, and that's self-administered powder or assisted suicide. That's what's been legalised in WA. Now, it hasn't been actually enacted yet. It's going to be enacted after the next election, and that's the Labor government policy. It's their bill that they brought forward, became an act. Now they're in an administration phase working out what poison will we do. Will it be class four or class six poison? I don't even know what poison it will be yet. They don't have any research about the effects of that poison in their hands. They're just going to take a go at it and base it on what happens in other jurisdictions in other parts of the world. And what's tricky about this is that there are other terms that have been used by this pro-euthanasia lobby that apply to another form of treatment, which is palliative care. They use terms like aid in dying, medical aid in dying, diagnosis and dignity, physician-assisted dying. They could all be equally used to describe palliative care practices. So they've changed the language. They've changed the whole conversation in the same way that the abortion debate is more pro-choice. So just be aware of that. So what is palliative care? Well, it's a human right, according to the WA Department of Health. Palliative care is a human right and is fundamental to improving the quality of life, well-being and dignity of all individuals. And even the Australian Medical Association, WA, declares that as well. So palliative care is about the choices that you might want to make at the end of your life, say, I want this kind of therapy. I want to decline futile treatment. I want a particular place of dying. I want symptom relief. And I want to refuse any kind of prolonged dying. That's what palliative care is about. And it's about particular pain relief and spiritual care that you want towards the end of your life. So it gives you time for closure. It gives you times for goodbyes, times to have forgiveness to people that you may feel like you might have wronged or they have wronged you, and reconciliation with people because you know your time is short. Euthanasia cuts short all of that. Palliative care is, is excellent in WA. In fact, it's world class. There's places where pretty much almost nobody suffers because of the provision of palliative care. The trouble that we have is there are places in WA where we have very limited access to palliative care. So if we were just funded a whole lot more and provide it closer to where people live, there'd be almost nobody dying with any serious pain or any serious mental anguish because they'd have that access. The problem we have is the government, when we, it was asked in the upper house, they wanted to give eight people unlimited money to go out and provide euthanasia anywhere, euthanasia and assisted suicide anywhere in WA. Another person in the upper house just asked a simple question. Will we provide one, person, one doctor and one nurse to go and provide palliative care? And they said no. So they will fund euthanasia anywhere in WA, but they will not refund even one limited access to palliative care. Euthanasia is this. It's basically, you get given this box to take home. It includes an anti-nausea pill, it includes an optional anti-anxiety pill, and plus the suicide powder. So you take this anti-nausea pill, anti-anxiety pill, if you like, and then the suicide powder is a combination of two different powders. You've got to mix it at the right rate, put it into water and stuff like that, and then you've got to take it standing, sitting up, or else you might end up throwing up the powder. That's how horrible it is that somebody has to kind of hold you sitting up to make sure you take all of it down. And if you fall over, then you might actually throw up some of it and then you end up not dying, you end up going into a coma. Now, there's a guy in Oregon that actually, that happened to him, and he woke up three days later and it took another 14 days for him to die. So there's complications that happen when people are given this stuff, and it's, it's quite clear in the overseas jurisdictions. I also want to clear up some things. That euthanasia is not, as I explained about palliative care, euthanasia is not not initiating or not continuing life-prolonging treatments. If you decline a treatment, you think it's futile, or you think it's just going to prolong, prolong your suffering, that's fine. And that's already completely legal. Treatment or action intended to relieve symptoms which may have a secondary consequence of hastening death. So if they, somebody gives you some serious painkillers that end up secondarily hastening your death, but it's a legitimate form of treatment, to treat your pain, that's not euthanasia and completely and utterly legal. Now, what was said in the debate was, you know, this is euthanasia. But in fact, it's not, and it's completely legal, and always has been legal, that you need good pain treatment towards the end of your life. 
and that's according to the AMA's position statement. As I said, palliative care is completely underfunded. Um, the WHO government has tried in its you know, largesse to actually fund this more, but as of the best knowledge we had as of last year, and they're just doing an in investigation in the upper house, a committee level investigation into the provision of palliative care right now, so we don't know the figures yet, but as of last year, one third of the specialists were what we had according to national benchmarks. WA and Victoria have the worst level of per capita provision of palliative care. We have one third of the care beds that we need by national benchmarks and the Labor government has tried to amend that in some ways, but the thing is they're given a bit of a Hobson's choice. If you have better access to euthanasia and limited access to palliative care, which will you choose? Even if the Labor government provides more to palliative care, they've still got a priority for other things. And WA and Victoria have the lowest funding, as I said, and WA needs at least $100 million a year in extra funding just for the facilities and resources, let alone staff funding. Now, as I mentioned, there's some complications that happen with euthanasia. In a retrospective study in Oregon and the Netherlands, it's between 3 and 7% of people actually develop complications. Now, when in the upper house, there was discussion by a vet, and he says, I know when you give these drugs to animals that they have suffer complications. You have to warn the owners of the pet, that they're going to suffer a seizure, very likely. You know, you're going to see something happen that's wrong. And that's the difficulty of working out what's the dosage for, for an animal. But for, an, for a human being, you know, do we know what goes on in the complications? They can develop, con lose consciousness, vomit, gasp of breath, develop seizures. And according to the Oregon study, when they looked at the reasons why people request euthanasia, pain wasn't even in the top five reasons that they wanted euthanasia. Most of the time, it was losing autonomy, losing the ability to walk or talk or, or do whatever they particularly wanted to do. I mean, Dr. Uh, Philip um, Goodall was a well-known 102-year-old uh, lecturer here in WA. He went and got euthanasia, even though all he was missing was the ability to walk and play golf. He could still talk very well, and Dr. Philip Nitsky and that dining with dignity kind of lobby all got behind him and said, we want to take you over to the Netherlands and help you kill yourself. So that's the, that's the level of, I guess, care that that lobby has for people is if you want it, we'll provide you the suicide um, kind of avenue. There's, there's going to be attack on cons consent. I mean, just looking at the Dutch government's review of it, consent becomes a very slippery term. Because in, in the Netherlands, you can have an advanced care directive that authorises people to euthanise you and they can still euthanise you without specifically finding out whether or not verbally you still give consent. And they did a retrospective analysis and found one in seven patients had been euthanised and hadn't given explicit consent at the time. So you can change your mind and the government has legally allowed the health system to kill you even though you don't actually want to be killed. In 2015, 431 people were killed without consent. Um, there was a tribunal in the same country in 2018 and they found this doctor had, with the family, conspired to say to this 74-year-old dementia sufferer, she'd been saying for years, not now, not yet, I don't want to die yet. And then the family and the doctor decided, it's time. We won't seek her consent. We'll hold her down. We'll feed a powder down her throat. And they held her down and then she died. And they did a tribunal and then a court case and they've completely cleared the doctor. That's the attitude of that society had so changed. And then we have a Dutch Supreme Court ruling in April 2020 that said that severe dementia sufferers can be legally euthanised. It eventually went to the Supreme Court. They had to do a, a ruling, and the ruling was it's all above board. We can do... And this is the, this is the culture change that happens in society. Now, the pro-euthanasia lobby says this is a slippery slope and it won't happen here. But the thing is, you know that activists want more and more loosening of the restrictions. They want more and more. They'll just keep going. As I said, and you see it already here in, in, in Australia, the Tasmanian bill that's been proposed by Michael Gaffney, MLC, is expands eligibility to a disease, illness, injury or medical condition that is serious, incurable, and irreversible. So there's no longer a time limit to your prognosis. You can have it basically whenever you like. And in fact, it explicitly allows people who have mental illness of any kind and also people that could refuse treatment fall into this criteria. If you refuse treatment and you could, you could be very well fixed up by that treatment, but you don't want it, you refuse it, you can be eligible for suicide. 
So it opens the door to lots of other things. And as, as explained in other OECD jurisdictions, there's no logical basis for expansion to social demand. Um, we know that in the Netherlands, already children 12 plus are euthanized with parental consent. And we've already had in Belgium several children killed for various conditions. A nine-year-old with brain tumor, 11-year-old with cystic fibrosis, a 17-year-old with muscular dystrophy. And the Quebec Supreme Court in Canada has ruled that the reasonably foreseeable criterion, in terms of reasonably foreseeable death, that's unconstitutional. So in terms of lawyers and constitutional lawyers find more and more things to write to reinterpret constitutions, when a society shifts in this way, then law becomes very malleable. That's, that's the problem that we have. And fifthly, the reason why I say euthanasia is terrible is that for Aboriginal people, they are already very distrustful of white man's medicine. They have this idea that you know white man isn't on our side. And this Senator Patrick Dodson, who's from the Labor side, he says there's a desperate need for culturally appropriate palliative care services in regional and remote areas. And he also said um, earlier, when First Nations people are already overrepresented at every stage of our health system, it is irresponsible to vote in favour of another avenue of death, to death. So this is his response. When you look at this WA proposal right now, and in fact it will, come, it will become law uh, unless something changes in the next election, an unspecialised nurse practitioner may administer and determine the mental capacity of an Aboriginal patient. Assisted suicide kits can be legally kept in any unsecured place. And think about in the Aboriginal community, the problems that we already know already occur. And there can be language and cultural misunderstandings that may lead to wrongful deaths. So let's think about abortion. Park that issue just for a little bit and then we'll come to abortion. This is just a simple argument you can make about abortion. You know that killing an innocent human life is wrong. Abortion kills an innocent human life, therefore abortion is wrong. So you ask them, okay, what is your definition of human? What is your definition of innocent? Why is it that you give yourself the right to life, but you don't assign right to life to somebody because of their location? So think about the sled test. Size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependence. Somebody can have varying levels of all those things. So you can have a toddler is smaller than an adult, but they have the same right to life. A toddler has a lesser development than an adult, but they have the same right to life. In environment and degree of dependence, same thing. And you can have a high degree of dependence towards the end of your life. And suddenly you go from low, uh, high dependence in the beginning and then low dependence as through your adult life and suddenly you become highly dependent. How does that change your right to life? Just because you change in those characteristics. Well, that's what the whole personhood theory has said. You know, You suddenly lose all of your... Uh, rights to life because you're changing location. So that's the kind of the logical argument you can make and say, look, an unborn child, just because they're located in the mother's womb, just because they have a few inches difference in where their location is, why do they suddenly have no right to life? And we know that one third of all children who are born at 23 weeks survive to at least age one, and the youngest that has survived was about 21 and a half weeks. We have better medical technology that even when the child is born prematurely, we can care for them very, very well. We, so, and also we have better medical technology about ultrasounds. We know when the heartbeat starts, as little as nine weeks. And, and the majority of abortions, about 95% that happen after that time because the mother doesn't come fully aware and isn't kind of prepared to take that ultimate step until after that. So there's all sorts of things we know scientifically that, change, that should change the conversation. We know there's at least 7,800 abortions in WA every year, and that represents about 19% of all pregnancies. Um, 562 of those are over 12 weeks, and 590 mothers are under age, 590 mothers are under age 20. So there's quite a lot of people that are in a vulnerable age group there. But that's good news is because of the fact that in 1998, when it was first legalized in WA, 26% of all pregnancies were aborted, were killed in the womb. There's a one abortion per hour in WA, and there's been over 180,000, maybe 200,000 since 1998 they've been killed. Across Australia, about 70 to 80,000 babies are murdered in the womb. That's, that's a huge, huge figure. When you think about the size of our stadiums, it's like a whole generation can fit in that thing, and that's all missing. 
in one one of that in, the, in our local stadium. Twenty seven have been born alive after a failed an abortion here in WA and left to die. And we know that between 1999 and 2018, that's government figures, they know. And what's interesting about that is the figures were there, but the coroner wasn't compelled to report on that. So Nick Goyran, a great MLC, a great Christian man in the upper house, has actually been investigating this in concert with other previous pro-life MPs. And they're investigating this every year, asking more and more questions, both about the general figures, but also about what's going to be happening here. Is the coroner reporting us? What's the coroner's report on this? Do these children have the right to defence? Legally speaking, it's illegal for them to not be given treatment. But because the mother says so and the doctor thinks the baby's not going to survive, they leave it to die. You know, basically can take hours for the child to die. Um, so it's awful what's happened in our society. Worldwide, we know that abortion is the leading cause of death, over 40 million every year. So one of the issues I've been coming up, uh, seeing is that because of this COVID crisis, the government, in their wisdom, has decided we're going to fund more and more telehealth. And one of those things that they see as a federal government as essential service is abortion. So they say, well, mother needs to be able to have access wherever she lives to get a pill sent to her to get an abortion consult with a doctor, with, her, with, her, with any doctor. Now they've just changed it so it has to be the local doctor that already knows you. But the awful thing about a telehealth conversation where you can be given a pill, mifepristone, is that that woman may live anywhere in Australia and doesn't necessarily have to be within one hour of a hospital. Now, if that woman, and it's very likely, it's like six in 100 women are going to get some complication when they take this abortion pill, they could be severely injured or killed if they're far away from a hospital. And there's no legal obligation for doctors to actually, or the abortion clinic to actually make sure the woman is close. So I'm, I'm, I'm lobbying MPs about that, and ACL and others, I've informed of that too. So we're going to lobby together about that. And there's another big issue as we think about COVID is that there are some history of the use of a, um, aborted fetal cells to produce vaccines. Now, the reason why, I'll just explain the reason why they, they're obtained is because Supposedly, it's easy to work out whether or not that cell will develop a tumour in the person after you inject it. So the reason why they use these for some vaccines rather than other ethical alternatives is because you can determine whether or not it will induce a tumour. So in certain vaccines like rubella, measles, rabies, polymyelitis, hepatitis A, chickenpox and smallpox, we know that there's between three and five different cell lines that they've obtained. Now, it's not just these five or so that are commonly used. There were hundreds of babies that were obtained from hospitals that were murdered and then have used those in experiments to find out the right candidate. So the hospital, in often cases, and this is most recent one is uh, Wellvax 2. It was obtained in China and the, the clinic specifically requested the hospital that they perform a water bag abortion on these children. They requested eight. They got eight that were water bag abortions. That what it means is they use water to inflate the uterus and extract the child. So they deliberately changed the method of abortion to obtain the most viable cells from this baby. And that was just as recently as 2010. So they're still needing more and more of these fetal cell-derived things. Um, as you see there, WI38 was a normally called girls' lungs. MRC5 was 14 work old boys' lungs. And we have C more uh, now in uh, exact scenes. So the COVID vaccines um, that we are being shown by our Prime Minister and by other, other companies, some of them, like from Johnson & Johnson, are using per C6. Now, this is an 18-week-old baby's retinal cells that was aborted in 1985. Um, in HEC 293, that's been used in several vaccines, including the AstraZeneca one that the Prime Minister just recently announced is they want to have an agreement with and use. Um, so a lot of people actually make an argument. You'll probably get a couple of questions later. They say, well, this happened so many decades ago. Why should I be worried about it? It's like just obtaining somebody who's been murdered and I obtain their organs. And I say to you, well, it's a bit different from that. It's like you knowingly received something that somebody is actually being murdered, you know, and it also the industry has specifically requested that this person was murdered 
in order to obtain this. So it's a bit of a different relationship. So there are alternative vaccines for COVID. There's BCG, which is a bovine-derived one that's for meningitis and other things. There's donated placenta cells from newborn babies. You can use that. You can use insect cells. You can use adult bone marrow cells. Now, I just say this to make you aware, to go and do your own research. Don't just listen to me. Think about it and, and watch videos. People talk about it a lot. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube to find out about, about these things. So in terms of us being pro-life people, there's a chart there I can send you that will explain to you the unethical and the ethical alternatives. There's an industry that's cropped up like by Planned Parenthood, where they will obtain babies. Not only do they get government funding to kill the child, but they also sell the aborted baby parts to medical research. And we know the figures of how much money they get from different parts because uh, the Centre for Medical Progress and Daniel Deleden has actually investigated this and they actually got on video the, the people from Planned Parenthood and the companies that they work with admitting this is what we pay for a certain part and stuff like that. And then they've had done court discovery in court because one thing I want to make you aware is the deputy, um, the running person for the Democratic Party, Camilla Harris, was actually the one that ordered that Daniel DeLeiden be arrested for investigating these things. So she, <laughs> that's how um, awfully you think about politics here. And there's the highest people in government can be the ones that are most opposed to the right to life. Um, so I just want to make you aware of that, and that's, that's kind of what happened in our society as a general rule. And so one of the good things is, as Donald Trump has actually said, we're not going to allow any kind of fetal research happening on the American soil. The problem is it still happens in other countries, um, and it still gets funded from American money in some way. Um, so moving on to some good news, though. <laughs> Every year in WA, we hold an annual Rally for Life, where we proclaim proclaim we love them both. We love the mother and the child. We want to see the, the mother who is participating in this to be forgiven and restored and healed. And also the children, the wonderfulness of children be proclaimed in our society. We hold at Parliament House. Now, of course, it hasn't happened this year yet because of COVID, but hopefully it'll happen in October. But every year it's about mid-May and it commemorates the legalisation in 1998 here in WA. So we gather together and say we were playing the goodness. And we have a, a little sing-song, a prayer time, and we actually talk to the parliamentarians that come out and, and affirm the life as well. And there's quite a few, there's a three or so in the Labor Party, and there's about you know, six or seven in the Liberal Party and a few others. And of course, you know from Marika, there's other Christian candidates that are standing in the next election that you can actually find out what is their policy and, uh, and vote for them and support them and develop a relationship with them. There's also peaceful um, sidewalk counselling people can do if you want to participate in this in a more active way you can go to an abortion clinic and there's a few around Perth and stand outside and say I'm here for you you won't be wearing anything kind of very awful in terms of depicting what abortion is you just say I'm here to help and you've got some pamphlets and there's some various organizations many of them Catholic ones that will be there to help you and support you to do that and they every year they hold a whole month kind of thing usually they go once a month but then there's one period around Ash Palm Sunday that they will actually go for a whole month every day and proclaim to mothers. But the thing is, of course, this kind of discourages women for going through with it. So, of course, like every other state in Australia, the WA government has proposed that they want to exclude any person from appearing outside an abortion clinic to discuss abortion who can't be close than 150 metres. They've proposed that and a bill is coming sometime this year, if not next year may happen after the next election. So the pretense is we want the privacy and dignity of every woman. And then it's a 150 metre exclusion zone. And every other state except South Australia has already enacted this. In ACT, it's a 15 metre exclusion zone. But the thing is, the government already has the power, if you're disturbing a woman under this Public Order Streets Act, to say if you're disorderly, if you're damaged, if you're a nuisance, if you're obstruction, if you jeopardise the safety physically, we can already fine you and move you on and arrest you if you, know, if you don't move on. There's already that power to do that. But every time the, the abortion clinics call the cops, and they call them almost every single time that the women are out there, or the people out there talking with these women, cops come, cops say, there's nothing to arrest you for, you're not doing anything against the law. So there's no actual police records, nobody arrested, nobody's ever been taken to jail 
So the, the reason for this build is completely um, inconsequential. There's no examples of harassment or abuse that were given by the WA government when they proposed this, and they had just interviewed two clinic directors that alleged anxiety and distress. They alleged it, and they didn't give any examples at all. So praying to end farming, praying to protect uh, trees or puppies or sharks or chickens, that's all fine. In our society, it's not okay to speak up to prevent abortion of murder outside an abortion clinic. That's, that's not right, apparently. So we want to help women in crisis. There's a bunch of Christian organisations. Christians and Catholics together work together about pro-life things. And there's a bunch of organisations that you can get in contact with if you want to help and volunteer to help women that are in crisis. Um, sorry, I just went. Pregnancy assistance, pregnancy problem house, pregnancy matters. Some of you, I'm, I'm surprised when I go around to churches, people aren't, aren't aware that these exist. So just make yourself aware of those things. Note them down. If you meet a woman that needs help, you know where to send her, you know, to give her help. So as I conclude my um, talk today, I want, there's three things I want to really encourage you with. These are really heavy issues. And a lot of you may not feel like you don't want to participate in this issue. Sometimes I doubt whether or not I want to participate in this issue because it's so heavy and so awful to think about what's happening to older people, people who are sick, and also to the unborn. I have two children. One's unborn. She's coming in a matter of a week or two. I have another little 18-month-old. His name is Luke, and he's wonderful. He's an amazing kid. And they're both miracles, actually. Um, I wasn't, wasn't expecting we'd have children. I, I've had cancer. I thought I was completely infertile. My wife, says, my wife has had endometriosis, and she's had several surgeries. So both of us, it's a complete miracle. How did God give us such a wonderful miracle? So the life, miracle of life is wonderful. Now, as we think about these scriptures, I pray they encourage you. So first of all, be prayerful. Honour God first in your life. Now, think about what the, the prayer of the early church was when they faced incredible opposition. And consider how you will vote in the next election too in the context of this. They, they prayed this, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. You can't fight this using human weapons. You fight this with the power of the Holy Spirit in you. you then, they, then because of the Holy Spirit in them, they spoke the word of God boldly and all of the believers were one in heart and spirit. Now one of the terrible tragedies I find in this is that as many churches that don't want to have this spoken about from the pulpit and they don't want to go out and do many things out in the public square about it because they're scared that some women will get a bit offended. Now we proclaim love. We proclaim truth. We love them both. I, I really pray for you and this church and you as individual Christians that you're one in heart and spirit on these things that really do matter. And that it's the Holy Spirit that will enable that. I can't coerce any of you to change your minds. It's the Holy Spirit that will convict you. And Peter and John then, when they're challenged by the Pharisees, what, are they, what should they do when they're told to shut up? They say, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to God? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. So just reflect on that verse and say, consider before the Lord, can I stop speaking about the right of unborn children? Now secondly, be purposeful. Think about what you will do in your life, what career you would choose. Some of you are university students. I know this church came out of a university movement. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. Don't obey the agenda of the world. Find out what God wants you to do and let him lead you. Read into the thing, to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So we pay our taxes. We participate in this society. What we proclaim, those things which are God's. And we don't allow the world to dictate those things. And finally, live such good, things among the, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So... Live such good lives as you're enabled by the Holy Spirit. They, they, they see the goodness of what you've done through Christ. And finally, be powerful. So be prayerful, be purposeful, and be powerful. It's by the Holy Spirit that you will do this. Every day we need to be powerful by the enabling of the Holy Spirit. Put on the full armour of God so that you can stake your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world 
against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It's awful that which society is doing right now. You can see the forces of evil are wanting to tell Christians and the church to be quiet about this. And it, it's pursuing its agenda to basically to make Christians and, and people who are shaky on this issue complicit, complicit with it and just not do anything about it um, and not speak up about it. So I pray that this church, and as you people, is, uh, depending on the Holy Spirit, and you're praying each day that this is some area that you know God can move you in. We have some other things, as I continue, that Family Voice is working on. We know that as a society we need a, a clean feed service of some kind to protect children against sexualization. At the internet level, children can access anything they like in the privacy of their bedrooms. They can do whatever, and it corrupts their minds, obviously. We all know these things. So there's one way in which it can be dealt with. The federal government wants to. Now, it's proposed a model that's based on the UK model where certain sites, you have to access it through an identity. You actually have to have an approved identity to go through and access certain adult sites. A problem I see with this is that some, there's a lot of social media that allows these things as well. And it's a good first step. And we, the federal government is trying to implement it. And it's going through a committee process right now, and our state directors are looking into it. We also want to see that children are not exposed to gambling advertisements on TV. So we, we've got a petition on that on our website. There's um, Japanese comics that have very high sexualization that are imported into Australia. We want to, um, we're contacting Paul Fletcher about that, and you can contact him personally as well, the Federal Communications Minister, to say this is stuff we don't want. And of course, as you know about the transgenderism issue that James Parker talk, spoke about last Sunday, um, we also want Greg Hunt, the MP, um, Federal MP for Health, to actually do something about the high rate of girls. And 45% of them are somewhere on the autistic spectrum. So they have this high focus, high concentration on this one little issue. They think that's going to solve their, their, their issue. So that's why they, they're being drawn into this um, peer pressure and social contagion that happens online. And there's 3% of all girls across the nation are autistic. So you can see the unrepresentation nature of that. We have some materials out the back for you to read. To have a look at what's happening in our society. Please take them any of those freely. The books, are, of course, are by donation, and the badges are just asking you to pay for like a dollar each. There's ones on drugs, there's one on euthanasia, there's ones on being a pro life person. Take a badge, and it can start conversations for you as you move around. Um, you can subscribe to our publications, connect with us, there's connect sheets out the back there to, to be part of that. And uh, thank you so much for. for uh, thinking through these things today, and I welcome your questions afterwards. Um, let's pray. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you for that we know that you're in control. Lord, we think about these heavy things and think about how terrible our world is. We know that you've given us this opportunity, this privilege to be light and salt, to bless this whole nation, this world, as it struggles and collapses because of the, the, the sin and the moral corruption that, that occurs. Lord, I pray you'd make us as your people and this church a refuge for people that have found trouble in all of these things. And Lord, if we are in trouble in one of these areas, if we have participated in these things, if we, some women here may have been through an abortion, I pray for your healing for them your forgiveness for them. We know that as they seek it before you, you will grant it. Your forgiveness is full and free. And I pray, Lord, you may heal your people, that we might be ministers of your great word and your great love for all people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>